Have you guys ever tried to make a budget? I feel like most of you probably at some point in your lives have sat down in front of a computer or a sheet of paper or whatever, and you've tried to make a budget. Me and Maggie just went through this process just a few days ago. And let me tell you, it's not a lot of fun, is it? My least favorite part of building a budget is that part where you realize two very important facts. The first is you don't make as much money as you thought you did. And the second is that you spend a lot more money than you thought you did. You see, right after you realize these two very important facts, you'll have a moment of budget comatose, where you'll stare at that sheet of paper with a longing look in your eye, like the protagonist in every romantic chick flick you've ever seen. Yeah, I watch chick flicks, don't judge me. When they're leaning out the window thinking, when, when will my husband come home? You know, that, that's how you look at your budget sheet, because you think if you stare at the budget sheet with enough love in your eyes, that maybe $10,000 will magically appear in your bank account. I had that moment a couple days ago while I was building my budget, and I think the reason why I have this moment, and you probably have had that moment in the past as, and as well, is, well, because we naturally worry about money we naturally worry about our incomes. If you have a lot of money, then you're scared of losing it. If you don't have very much money, then you're scared that you won't make it to the next paycheck. We worry, sometimes constantly, about money. Today, we are finishing our sermon series, A Port in the Storm, Your Battle Plan Against Anxiety. And the anxiety that we are discussing today is the anxiety that comes from worrying about money, whether you have a lot of it or a little of it or anywhere in between. We want to ask the question today, how can we be less anxious about our money? How can we be more comfortable with our finances? How can we be more fulfilled and less concerned when it comes to the number in our savings account. We want to ask that question today, and luckily I think the Bible answers those questions. I think it answers it in two parts. Once in the Old Testament, which is repeated in the New, and once in the New Testament, which had been echoed already in the Old Testament. We're going to look at two specific passages today, and the first one will be in a book of, of advice known as Proverbs. It's important to remember that Proverbs is indeed a book of advice. If Proverbs had a subtitle, it would say the book of Proverbs. If you follow my advice, it'll work 95% of the time. These are not guarantees. Most of them are not commands, although it has a few. The book of Proverbs is a book of advice from God written down by very wise men in the ancient world, basically saying if you follow this advice 90 to 95% of the time, things are going to work out well for you. There's always that 5% that's outside of your control, but if you follow the advice in the book of Proverbs, it'll normally work out well. Today, we'll be in Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 6. The scripture reads, go to the ant, you sluggard. That's a fun word, isn't it? Go to the ant, you sluggard, and consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in the summer. It gathers its food at the harvest. Go to the ant, you what? You sluggard? That's a word that we probably don't use very often. Some of your translations, if you're reading along in a different translation, might say, you lazy person or you lazy bones, which is another word that, frankly, we don't use very often. But I don't think lazy is the best translation to use here, because when you and I think of laziness, we think of when you drop an ice cube on the floor, and you think, man, I should pin over and pick it up and put it in the sink, but... I don't know about that, so you just kick it under the fridge. When you and I think of lazy, you think about that time that you were laying down on the couch watching Netflix, and you really realize you didn't really want to watch the show or the movie you're watching just at that moment, but you don't know where the remote is, the TV's so far away, so you call for your spouse, and you're like, hey, Maggie, come in here. Uh, Can you change the channel for me so you don't have to get off the couch? 
When you and I think of lazy, we think of momentary lapses, of, of small moments, small incidents of laziness. But when the Jews called someone a sluggard, they didn't mean somebody who was momentarily lazy. They meant someone who lived a lifestyle of laziness. The Hebrew word for sluggard here is only used in the book of Proverbs. It's not used anywhere else in the Old Testament. And the sluggard in Proverbs is described as someone who is mechanically hinged to their bed. Like somebody put hinges on their side and on their mattress. All they could do is roll. They can't get out of bed. They're stuck here. They can only roll. They're described as someone who reaches for a plate of food, grabs a fistful, and then falls asleep before they can get it to their mouth. The sluggard is chronically lazy. They're someone who is incapable of supporting themselves, of caring for themselves. They're someone who could hold a job. They have the skill. They don't have a mental illness or a physical disease, no. But they just don't want to. So they don't. That's what a sluggard is. And this proverb is addressed to the sluggard. Now I'm guessing most of you watching are not sluggards. Most of you, if you are capable you support yourselves. You have savings. You had retirement funds. Many of you are still working. Or perhaps you're a stay-at-home parent because you decided it would be best for you to spend time with your child and your spouse can support the family. And all of those situations are great. This proverb probably isn't written to you. But there's a handful of you, maybe, that are seeing this now when it premieres or are seeing this 10 or 20 years in the future, that if you're honest with yourself, you have a few characteristics of a sluggard. You only work a few hours a week, and it's not because you can, it's not to spend more time with your family, it's not for any of those reasons, it's not because you're retired, but you just want something to occupy your week, it's not that. It's just that, frankly, if you're honest with yourself, even though you or your family could use the extra income, you're just a little bit too lazy to pick up more hours. There's some of you, perhaps, that are watching that are still in school, and you know you have hours when you aren't working on homework, when you aren't working on classes. You know you could maintain a good GPA if you picked up a job on the side, but you chose not to because you know mom and dad will foot the bill if you don't get a job. They'll pay for your gas. They'll pay for you to go out. So why get a job when someone else is paying the bills? There's a few of you who, if you're honest, have a few characteristics in common with the sluggard. And what is Proverbs advice for you? Well, they say to go to the ant. And you think, man, that's kind of weird. But then he explains, the Proverbs writer explains, he says, go to the ant. Why? Because no one has to make the ant work. There's no bosses. There's no overseers. There's no kings. There's no one getting ready to fire the ant if they don't wake up in the morning and go to work, yet they work anyways. And I know some of you are saying, well, they do have an overseer. They have a queen. Well, it's kind of a misleading term because the queen in an ant colony is really just like everyone's mom. She just gives birth. She doesn't force other ants to work. The ants just do it themselves. They choose to. They are self-motivated. And Proverbs says, if you're worried about money, and the reason why you're worried about money is because you just aren't working enough. You aren't earning enough income, and it's something within your control. You could pick up a few more hours and still have time to spend with your family. You could put a little effort into looking into investing and make some wiser financial decisions. Or if you want to expand that a little bit, you know that you're spending a little bit too much, but you're just too lazy to budget. If you have some characteristics in common with the sluggard and you're worried about your finances, Proverbs advice is be like the ant. Work for your money. Like I said, many of you watching, you don't fall into those categories. You don't work or you work part-time because your family can afford it and you know you have enough income, you have good reasons to spend a little bit more time on an important hobby or, or volunteering or spend more time with your children or grandchildren. Many of you work full-time or you worked full-time for many years and you're now enjoying a well-earned retirement, but you still worry about money because it's part of human nature. So what about you? What about the people who are working or have worked, who know they're in at least an okay financial situation, but they can't help but check their bank balance every single day on their phone? What does the Bible say to you? Well, that advice is in Matthew. 
And Jesus speaks to you and he informs you that if you aren't a sluggard, if you aren't a lazy person and you still worry about your finances, well, maybe you need to change your priorities. Maybe it's not that you don't have enough income or enough savings. Maybe it's a problem of you elevating money too highly. Maybe you think of money too highly and God and family and other priorities too lowly. In Matthew chapter six, Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body and what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Jesus says, hey guys, if you're worried, you know about what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna wear, where you're gonna live, the kind of car that you're gonna drive. If you're worried that your, your IRA, well, it's not quite growing fast enough, don't worry. Just don't. And we think, Jesus, that's not helpful. It's really not, man. I mean, you were the son of God. How many concerns did you have? Yeah, I mean, the, the end there, you know, that, that last year of your life, that got a little grisly there at the end, but you knew how it was gonna turn out, right? You performed miracles. There was a day when you were gonna miss lunch and you went, you know what? I have a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread and you just multiplied them. How many concerns did you have, Jesus? And you know what? Those are valid concerns. I'll be honest. Those are valid concerns. But Jesus doesn't start off this sentence by saying, don't worry. He starts off by saying, therefore. And any time in the Bible, if you've been in church long enough, you've probably heard this. Any time you're reading the Bible and you see the word, therefore, you ask, what's that therefore, therefore? See, therefore is a very important word in English, and the word is representing in Greek is also a very important word because essentially what it means is, I have given you my evidence, here is my conclusion. I have already laid out fact one, two, three, four, and five. Here is the take-home truth for you. Jesus is actually concluding an argument here in chapter six, verse 25, one that he laid out before. Well, what, what was the evidence for this argument? Jesus was discussing the kingdom of heaven. And here's the basics of what he said. The kingdom of heaven is eternal. It lasts forever. Things in heaven are vitally important, not just now, but for all of eternity. Money, on the other hand, only lasts a few years. Take my bank account, for example. I had my first bank account in my name. It was attached to my parents' account, but it was still in my name. At 17 years old. I'm currently 22. So I've had a bank account at various banks in my name for about five years now. If I live to the ripe old age of 90, then I will have had a bank account for around about 73 years. And 73 years, it's a pretty long time. I think most of us would agree that. But 73 years is a blink of the eye when you compare it to eternity. And that's the point of Jesus's argument here. He's saying, look, there are some things that are eternal. There are some things that are of God. There are some things that last forever and money is not one of them. He clarifies this argument in verse 33 when he concludes his discussion and he says, seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus doesn't just say, don't worry. He tells you exactly why you shouldn't worry. Because money, money doesn't last forever. So if your account's a little bit lower than you think it should be, so what? Money wouldn't last forever. If you're worried about what you will wear tomorrow or what you will eat tomorrow, isn't God still in control? He will either feed you tomorrow or perhaps he won't. And that's a hard thing to accept. But either way, your soul's still secure. Money is not the end-all be-all. It shouldn't be number one on your list of priorities. Jesus says don't worry about money because in the grand scheme of things, money isn't that important. In the grand scheme of things, your house is isn't that important. In the grand scheme of things, the quality of education you were able to afford probably isn't that important. The car that you drove, the food that you ate, 
in the grand scheme of things, whether you're able to afford to eat at all may not be as important as we think it is. And man, that's a hard truth to accept. But if you want the secret to not worrying about money, if you said, hey, I'm not a sluggard, it's not that I need to work and just earn more money, I've done my work and I'm still worried about my finances, if you want the solution, well, Jesus gives it here. Because Jesus says you shouldn't live for your money. When we put these lessons together, I think we find a solution for everyone. You have to work for your money, but you can't live for it. Let's think about a theoretical man that maybe is a little bit closer to some of you than, than you'd like to admit and is probably a little bit closer to me than I'd like to admit too. We'll name the guy Jack. And Jack, he's a pretty standard 30, 35-year-old guy. He has a young family, has a wife. And Jack, he's a hard worker. He works somewhere between 50 and 60 hours every week. I mean, he is working himself to the bone. And he makes good enough money. He can support his family. His wife works as well. But he knows he's the breadwinner. He makes a little bit more than she does. He can provide for his kids, and they don't get everything they want, but they get everything they need. And Jack knows it, and he knows in a couple more years, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, he'll be able to retire. Jack's comfortable financially, but he can't help but worry. He always feels like he's waiting for the other shoe to drop. He feels like, what if, what if the economy goes into a recession and I lose my job? He worries, what if the few investments I have made, what if they go bad and I lose all the money I've put into them? He worries that he won't get the raises that he's expecting and he won't be able to retire until he's into his 70s or his 80s. And so Jack becomes a little bit obsessed, a little bit obsessed with making sure that he has enough money, that he has enough income, that he has enough savings. So Jack, on his rare days off, probably doesn't spend the amount of time with his kids that he should. He's balancing the checkbook. He's double-checking the budget. He's making sure that they didn't overspend because if they overspend what they've budgeted, he won't be able to save as much money as he wants to. He won't feel safe. He won't feel comfortable. So he's never really fully present with his family. He already spends 50 or 60 hours a week working. He spends another 10 on the weekend staring at budget sheets at IRA accounts, at savings accounts, and at checkbooks. What does it look like for Jack to realize, yeah, you have to work for your money, but you can't live for it? Maybe it looks like Jack acknowledging that, you know what, he can afford to take a few less hours at work. Maybe that 50 hours becomes 45. Maybe that 60 hour weeks becomes 55. And those precious few more hours, well, he gets to spend them at home with his wife and his kids. Maybe it looks like him deciding that if I'm going to balance the checkbook, I'm going to do it on Wednesday night and not on Saturday, not on my one day off. Because that one day off, every week that weather permits, we are going on a family picnic and I'm spending time with my children. Maybe it looks like Jack realizing the Sundays are a little more sacred than he'd been treating them because frankly, he hasn't been to a church in years. Not because he doesn't believe in God, but just because, well, he could pick up a few more hours at the office and make a little bit more money and maybe he sets that aside so he can attend church with his wife and his children. For Jack, maybe that's what it looks like to realize that you work for your money, yeah, but you can't live for it. For you, maybe it's a little more extreme than Jack's case. Or maybe it's a little less Maybe some of you have to change your actions, work less, spend less time staring at your bank app. And maybe some of you, there's no actions to be changed, but just an attitude, just a thought that has to be replaced. But we all have to realize you have to work for your money, but you can't live for it.
Hey guys, if you enjoyed the sermon, if you were moved by it, then please don't let this moment pass you by. Contact us. You can email us at info at bereanconnect.com. You can call the church offices. The number is on our website. And while you're at it, follow us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, like this video wherever you see it. It really helps us to get the message out there and to connect with more people. We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today, and we can't wait to see you again. Bye.